So I'm going to talk to you today about solar organic carbon storage in the Chicago ecosystem. And I'm not going to be talking to you about trees too much. So I'm going to be talking to you about soils. So I hope everyone's ready for that. <laughs> so Dr. Wobbles did a, a great introduction on climate change. And this is a picture of the Earth. And I'm talking a lot today about carbon storage, and in particular, stocks. And starting with the globe, these are the major carbon stocks that we find on the Earth. And the vast majority of carbon is found in long-term carbon storage pools, such as carbonate rocks, the oceans, or fossil resources. So those numbers are in gigatons of carbon, which is billion metric tons of carbon, so I don't have a schnazzy conversion like Peter was giving you in terms of how much carbon that is, but that's a lot of carbon. Those are big stores. Um, the missing portion of global carbon stocks are these active pools. So that's the soils, the atmosphere, and the plants, and the trees. So that's the carbon that's dynamic, actively cycling. And, and you can see the vast majority of that carbon, or a major portion of that carbon, across most terrestrial systems is found in soils. Soils are a very important store of carbon across the globe. And then within biomes, that proportion of carbon that is stored in vegetation versus the carbon stored below ground does vary. Um, this is the, the number given there in gigatons is the total carbon stock, and the number in parentheses is the, the, the amount that's stored below ground relative to, to total carbon. Um, so you can see, first off, we have a lot of carbon in our forest systems. The second sort of system that stores, that in terms of proportion of our global carbon stocks, are our prairie systems. And then we have the, the wetlands and the tundra systems. We have croplands and deserts. And then we have this missing chunk. Any ideas where this, what this missing chunk is? If any of you know, you should let everyone else know, because we don't really know. <laughs> And, and what I'm proposing to you is maybe that some of this missing chunk, of a big portion, or, or, or maybe a little smaller portion, might be found in, within the urban area. Okay, so about 3% of the Earth is considered urban right now. But there's a lot of that, that area, or an exp a larger area, that might also be considered exurban. And these are some nighttime images of, of the, this one in particular is the United States, the last one was the, the globe. And as much as 15% of the total United States might be considered that ex-urban area. And then we know if we zoom in on smaller regional scales, certain areas have even higher densities. And this is Cook County, which happens to be about 26 urban. And that's pretty similar to in terms of the density that you'll see in many of the European countries, which are closer to 30% urban. So there's a good amount of land that is considered urban. And there's also this increasing amount of land that would be classified as urban. So we know that global population is increasing, projected to hit 10 billion by the, the end of the century. And we also know that more and more people are living within cities. So we might be at close to 80% of the total global population being considered urban dwellers. So that land is, 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 is small right now, but it's certainly increasing. Um, so back to the United States, we have about 150 million hectares of urban land in the United States. And we don't know a lot about the carbon within that urban area. There's been one nice paper by Chikurna et al. in 2010 that detailed the carbon stocks within an urban area. They found the major stocks were soils, vegetation, landfills, and buildings. Which, what's the biggest contributor there? What's the largest stock you think in an urban area? I'm going to make this interactive and make sure you're all awake. Soils, right? That's what I'm talking about. Soils, of course, it's going to be soils. Right? So the vast majority of carbon in urban area, what we, what we think is definitely contained in soils. Vegetation, followed by landfills and buildings. But like I said, we don't really have a good picture of, of how much carbon are found within, within urban areas. Um, so within the soil itself in cities, how much carbon do we have? And, and now we're talking about carbon density. And the, the units I'll give um, from here on out the rest of the presentation are in kilograms per square meter. And that's a typical unit we'll use to express carbon within soils. Um, this first set of data includes the, 
the surface soil. So just that carbon found in the upper 30 or 40 or centimeters so of soil. And we have high and low values from the literature. And we're talking in um, terms of range of 0.2 to about 23 kilograms per square meter. So um, back to, to Peter's analogies, maybe this is, how many kilograms are you, Peter? How much you weigh? 90. So about a third of Peter in our highest estimates, and maybe down to his foot in, in our lowest estimates in the 0 to 30 centimeters. And then when we get deeper, we find that that carbon amount might be might be much more variable, and it also increases. The problem is most of the studies that have been performed so far have really focused just on that topsoil layer. And there's been very few studies that have looked deeper. So this is some literature that's found um, soil organic carbon density down to a meter, so 100 centimeters or so. And you look right away that you do see quite a bit of variation. This is some work by Steve Versiti in Baltimore. Um, 2.5, 16 is as high, all the way up to New York where we had 285 kilograms per square meter or about four peters um, in, a, in a meter of soil. So that's a lot of variation, but you also look at how many, how many sites these studies included. So Steve's actually included the most, 32, but many of these four sites, five sites, 20 sites, two sites, two, seven, so there's not a lot of research out there, and the research that's been conducted has focused really on the surface, and the ones that have gone deep really haven't looked at a lot of pots. Okay? So there's a need to fill the, the urban soil carbon gap. And what I think the importance of this research that we're conducting, three, three, three major importances. The first would be towards improving our global and regional estimates of carbon storage. So most of the carbon storage estimates or budgets that we currently perform, they're really focused just solely on trees. But we might be missing 66% of the, that carbon, total carbon, because we know that in most systems, the majority of the carbon is below ground. So we might be undervaluing our resource. With that, if, if we get a better idea of what we know of urban soil carbon storage, we can then look at that data to project what would happen when we disturb it, or what might happen under different climate change scenarios. Will that soil that's being soil in the city be a future sink or potentially a source for carbon? And then we all know, or maybe we don't know, but I, th I think most would know that soil organic matter or is about 50% carbon, and soil organic matter is very important for soil quality. It's one of the primary determinants of, of soil quality. And part of this study, in which I won't be able to cover today, is we are also creating a, a site index, an urban site index specific to trees. And this site index is heavily weighted towards carbon. So, and it's, it's a field diagnostic tool that assesses soil carbon as well as a, a bunch of other parameters in the field. And we're finding that it is a good predictor of overall tree condition. This is just some preliminary data from five cities, um, Chicago, um, Boston, Springfield, if, um, and the two Indiana cities, but we still have seven, six cities to go on this. Okay, but I don't, I'm not going to be able to talk about this today. So the Chicago Urban Forest Study. So Emma introduced that, thank you. And I'll talk a little bit about the objectives relating to soils. So the first objective relating to soils for this study was to get a better understanding of spatial distribution of soil organic carbon in the Chicago land ecosystem. And what we thought we'd find is that we, we, we think that the carbon contents in the urban system are actually going to exceed what you'd see in natural systems. And that might be counterintuitive. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of literature out there saying that, you know, carbon, urban soils are deficient they're in carbon, they're, they're poor substrates, but some of the more recent studies have actually found um, urban soil organic carbon contents to be quite high. And that's because a lot of these soils are, are extremely artificial, and we put a lot of inputs into these systems. So we're speeding up the organic matter cycle, and, they might, and, and we do think that they're going to be higher than the natural soils. And we think that there's going to be a major portion, an unaccounted for portion, below in, in deeper resources. So below the typical sampling of 25 centimeters, we think that we're going to find a lot more carbon down there when we go deeper. And then the, the second kind of major objective was to take this data that we're collecting in Chicago 
build a model that can be applied to other cities and other regionals um, to, to really expand the breadth of, of the research. Okay. So what sort of things would we look at to develop this model? Um, any suggestions? I flashed through it real quickly, but hopefully you didn't see that. If you were going to try and predict carbon in the urban ecosystem, what would you do? Carbon inputs. Okay, so who's inputting carbon? Plants, trees, organisms. Okay, that's one thing we, we, you want to look at. Anything else? You guys remember, you guys, you guys know who Hans Yeni is? He was my personal hero. <laughs> so he developed the state factor of how soils form. Okay, so soils form through the interaction of climate organisms relief parent material in time. And we're going to take this model and we're going to use it to see if we can apply it to the urban soil organic carbon pool and predict carbon storage. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of factors that give us an index on climate, some organisms, so we can look at tree cover, um, relief parent material, and time. So parent material is just what the soil is weathering from, time is how long the soil has been there, relief is changes in topography. Okay, so that's the second, second objective. And what we thought there is that in the urban soil organic carbon pool, we think that's going to be heavily influenced by organisms. And we also think that humans are going to have a strong influence on soil organic carbon storage. And we don't think factors such as relief, parent material, and, and climate will be as important in terms of predicting soil organic carbon. So, organisms. So what do we do? I'm going to um, kind of briefly introduce this so I won't go into too much detail. Um, we have 190 plots stratified throughout the Seven County region, and they're stratified by land use. And the land uses we have are the CITUV, this is commercial, industrial, transportation, utility, and vacant lands combined. Okay, so that's an example, a picture of one of those plots. We have residential plots. We have park plots, which also include golf courses, forested plots, and then agricultural plots. Each one of the plots are, are 0 0.04 hectares, and we did all the soil sampling within a five meter or so radius from plot center. Um, on each one of those plots, we collected two deep soil cores down to 100 meters, and we also collected shallow cores from 10 different plots and combined them, and we did some litter sampling as well. Okay, so Emma talked about the tree responses. I'm not gonna cover that. I'm gonna talk about the soil responses. Um, so. We measured litter depth. We also collected the litter. We took the composite soil cores with a, a sampler to get a, a, a better distribution of the surface soil properties. And then we used this sampler to collect deep cores. So there's a reason why people haven't done a lot of deep core sampling in urban areas. It is extremely difficult. And um, we, we did have quite a couple accidents, actually, with this, this sampler, and, but uh, no, no major losses, just some, some small digits being hurt in the shoulders and such, <laughs> and, and many uh, breakdowns of the sampler. It, it is quite difficult to get through urban soils with, with a sampler. Okay. But those deep soil cores were then taken back to the lab and laid out on trays, and I described them. So in total, we had um, 380 deep soil cores, two per plots, and we delineated 1,293 horizons. So I'll say that again because it's a big number, and we did a lot of work with that. So 1,293 horizons were delineated. And then from each one of those horizons, we determined color, structure, texture, bulk density, soil organic carbon, nitrogen, pH, and electroconductivity. And as far as I'm aware, this is the, the largest sampling of carbon data in an urban system that, I, that I've ever seen. So it's, it's, a, it's a great body of research, and we're using this as a, as a means to jump off and allow others to, to model our, what we've done. Um, the surface soils, I'm not going to talk a lot about this today, but we did the, the typical physical, chemical, and biological properties on these surface soils. All right, before I get into the data, I'm going to show you some pictures. So my advisor, Jim Bachheim at University of Madison, said this all the time, soils don't lie. So some of the stuff you'll see in the data, I'm hoping you'll be able to see in the pictures too. All right, so we basically had two types of natural soils. The stuff on top and the stuff on the bottom. And here's a, a zoom in there. What, what kind of soils are those? Mollusols, I heard somebody say it, right? It's mollusol. 
So prairie, so we're the prairie state, Illinois, mollusols. We have lots of these. And this is a pretty good mollusol. What kind of soil is this right here? It's an alpha soil. So a forested soil. And these are, these are quite common. So many of our profiles look like these. So these are undisturbed natural soils that, that were included in our sampling. So they have, you can see by color, there's a lot of organic matter in that mollusol. Less so in, the, in this alpha soil. Then we had a lot of soils that, that I call disturbed natural soils. So they were probably mollusols, alpha sols, maybe some histosols, but then there's some sort of disturbance that, that has been done to them. And this is an example. And this is actually within the same plot. These are two replicate cores within, within that same plot. This is the natural soil, probably um, a mollic alpha sol. And then here, all that good topsoil is scraped off, and you can see it was compacted. And that color there, that grayish color, is probably reducing conditions, standing water. Okay? So we had a lot of soils that looked like this. And then we had these urban soils that were completely artificial. Um, some of the things that we saw in these soils, we saw lots of buried roads, buried concrete. This happens to be bricks. We, and, and surprisingly, we were able to get through a lot of these, or, or Emma and the, and the field crew were able to get through a lot of these hard layers with our sampler, which was cool, because we were able to, to capture these roads. Um, we saw lots of different types of debris. So this, what I, the best I can tell, this looks like some maybe some asphalt debris within the, the urban soil there. We saw lots of soil profiles with really truncated horizons. So no, no gradations as we moved down the profile, they just stopped. And in this case, there's really heavy organic stuff here and then straight sand here. Here we have a, a sandy material over a compacted, um, probably B horizon, real heavy clay and then a, a more compacted horizon down here. And then one thing we saw more and more is that we saw lots of organic matter within the urban soils, which was really cool. So very deep, high organic matter contents. Okay, so what do we see? So <clears throat> this, this shows us the, the total depth we were able to get at in all these cores, and on average we got to a depth of about 90 centimeters. So we were able to get pretty deep on most of these cores. And on each one of those, those cores, we described about four horizons. And the depths of those horizons vary between 25 to, to 30 centimeters or so. Topsoil thickness in general was about 30 centimeters, and that was overlain by about 60 centimeters of subsoil thickness. Okay, so that's just descriptive statistics of, of what, what the soils look like. But the first question was, how does soil organic carbon vary with depth? Okay, so this is organic carbon percentage. So we had a higher percentage of carbon in our topsoil, but then if we pair that with bulk density, our density increased with depth as we went down the, the soil profile. And you use both of those numbers together to get the kilograms per meter squared in your profiles. So we actually found a lot of carbon deeper in the soil profile. So below 20 centimeters, 20 to 80 or so centimeters, 75% of the carbon was contained there. So yes, our, our, our second part of our first hypothesis was that we'd see a lot of carbon deep, and yeah, we did see most of the carbon deeper in the profile. And that's important because it, we have to go deep if we want to really get a good idea of how much carbon's in urban soils. And it also tells us that maybe 100 centimeters is not deep enough. If you look at this curve, it's not stopping at 100 centimeters. And I project that with some modeling that's likely we might have to go to 200 centimeters. All right, so the second question is how much soil organic carbon is in Chicagoland soils? So on the mean carbon content that we saw across all of our sites was about 36 kilograms per square meter. And where that fits in with what we know with the existing literature is we're on the lower end. Um, we're certainly not anywhere near this 163 that was done on two plots by Joel McPherson in 1995. We're, we're more around here. And the vast majority of our sites were 25 to 45 or so kilograms of carbon per square meter. And where this fits it with other soils across the globe, these are our major 12 soil orders, these histosols are swampy soils. Those are our highest organic matter soils in terms of kilograms per square meters, much higher than any of these other soils. We're at the high end. We're certainly not over here by the desert soils or the forest soils or some of our newer soils. We're towards the higher end. Okay? Um, so this is a map that we created of soil organic carbon density across of all of our plots. 
And we also, the first step was to look at how this varied by county. We didn't see any differences across county boundaries for solar organic carbon. There's not really any strong reason to suggest that we would. But I used that in order to kind of give you an idea or put some context uh, behind how much carbon is found within the Chicagoland region and within each county. So I computed the, the anthropogenic emissions within each county based on per capita emissions. And then the second bar, this first bar is the solar organic carbon stock of each one of those counties and the total region. And the second bar is the anthropogenic the second bar is the solar organic carbon stock. Sorry about that. And you put those two together, this is the solar organic carbon divided by the anthropogenic emissions. So this is kind of a ratio that tells us how much carbon is in the soil relative to how much we're emitting as humans within that county. Um, and, and that could be anywhere between 5 and 246. So a county like Lake County has a lower population density and also had higher solar organic carbon soils. Okay. So, and, and it's, it's important because it kind of puts in the context of how much carbon is actually in these soils. And, and it's quite a bit. So, what, what we think is that there's a lot of organic carbon in urban systems relative to other systems. And it definitely it needs to be accounted for in, in global national regional carbon budgets. So, we want to predict it. So, the next step was to kind of, how can we... Can we test this model, this Hans Jennings model of soil forming factors as a way to predict soil organic carbon? So starting with climate, um, this is latitude. And we use that as a proxy for, for uh, temperature. And we expected when you go higher in latitude that you'd have a or higher organic carbon content. And we didn't see that. We also looked at longitude. And here we did see a significant but very weak relationship. Thank you. Um, so, and, and as we move further towards the lake, we had higher organic carbon contents. We looked at gravimetric soil moisture on the soils that we collected, and we didn't see any relationship with soil moisture. And so far, what, we don't think climate's a strong indicator of soil organic carbon, so um, we still have, we're still analyzing this data, but it's not looking too good for climate. Organisms, so are trees important? Well, trees versus no trees. We saw no difference in soil organic carbon just looking at our tree plots versus our, our non-tree plots. So that tells us probably not so far, um, and I was kind of surprised at that. So then I looked a little bit further. I looked at the differences between topsoil and subsoil, and again, I found no differences or no effect of trees on soil organic carbon contents. Basal area, not a predictor of soil organic carbon. And litter depth, surprisingly, wasn't an indicator of soil organic carbon. So overall, I don't think trees are having an impact on soil organic carbon on these systems. Relief. This is the percent slope on each one of those spots. No strong relationship with, in terms of predicting soil organic carbon, or no differences. Elevation, again, no differences. So relief is probably not an important predictor of soil organic carbon. What about parent material? So that's the material that the soils are weathering from. These are different merino associations. Um, we saw no differences in merino association for organic carbon content. And then we also looked at the thickness of the drift layer on each one of those plots. And, and not any significant differences among these. So parent material doesn't seem to be, oh, and lastly I looked at the silt and clay content of each of those soils. And again, not a strong indicator of soil organic carbon content. So I don't think parent material is that important. What about time? So this is a proxy for time. It's the soil order, entosols being our earliest. So these are formed within the last 10, 15, 20 years versus histosols, which are, are older soils, and mollusols and alpha soils, a little bit older soils as well, too. Here we did see some significant differences amongst the soil orders, so that might be an indicator of time, but it's actually the opposite. Our newest soils had the highest organic carbon content. So time doesn't, I don't know. Back to organisms and humans, which we do think is, is a strong predictor of organic carbon. So here we stratify the data by land use, and here we find significant differences. We have our greatest carbon contents in our most urbanized land use. That CITUV is commercial industrial transportation, utility, and vacant land had significantly greater carbon content compared to our agricultural plots, and then there are other plots were in between there. And if we look at the, the, the real difference lies in the subsoil. Um, carbon content, not in the topsoil carbon content. That's where we had our strongest differences. 
And this kind of complements what Steve Rossiti had found um, when he compared forest to urban. He saw an actually a 28% or so increase in, in urban compared to forest. And when we do the same with our data, we see a 25% increase in urban relative to forest. And when we compare our urban plots with our agricultural plots, we're seeing an 80% increase in soil organic carbon. So it seems to me that urban is kind of inf increasing soil organic carbon. So some other metrics of, of urbanization, this is urban per impervious surface area. And we found that when we had more surface area, we had, we had greater organic carbon contents, although not a very good relationship, it's significant, but a weak one. And then when we move further and further away from Navy Pier, we had less and less carbon content. So if you're not familiar with kind of the Chicago region, we're, as we, in all directions from Navy Pier, as we kind of move out, we get less urbanized. So humans, I do think, are an important predictor of solar organic carbon. So can we model these using the, this information that we, we've gathered? Um, we can, and this is the approach that we're taking. Um, so first off, we just did some stepwise regression. Thank you. And we found that we can model um, organic carbon content using things like surface soil properties. Carbon content and the pH, we, did a we got a pretty decent model across all land uses. But then we, when we split it up by land use, that model improves quite a bit. We're at 73% of the variance explained. Although the factors within each one of those land uses are different. So for instance, calcium content tend to be the strongest predictor in their agricultural lands. Um, here we have lead and pH that are important for forestry. For residential, a whole bunch of factors. For the urbanized area, we have elevation, sodium, and carbon. Park, we have road. So all these different, in each landscape, we have to develop a separate model, essentially, if we want to predict organic carbon, which is challenging. Um, and then here's the tree, so just the trees. So I think we can model, and we've taken a stab at that. Thank you. Um, and this is a raster image, and I'll wrap up here in a second. Um, the next step is for us to take this image of soil organic carbon and combine it with some data layers like land use, roads, impervious surface area, land cover, soil survey, and other information to see if we can predict that soil organic carbon density across the Chicago region. And we do think it's possible. We think that we need to focus on land use, urbanization, and soils data. And just to conclude, we have high carbon contents in the Chicagoland region, and in total about a half a gigaton of carbon, which is about 5% of the total U.S. carbon content in urban areas. And we do think it can be modeled with urban factors, land use, and surface soil properties. So thanks to, to my um, collaborator, Bob Fahey. Um, Emma has done most of the work, and Michelle's done most of the lab work for this project. Many of the students on this project, the Morton Arboretum Center for Tree Science, and funding from the NUCPAC. So we do have a website for the project, so if you're interested to see more and, uh, and get more information, there it is.